It's time to go on the record with WRAL News. One of the most closely watched U.S. House races in the country is in our area, North Carolina's newly drawn 13th district. Tonight, we'll sit down with the candidates hoping to earn your vote. Good evening and thanks for being with us. I'm Lena Tillett alongside our Capitol Bureau Chief, Laura Leslie, tonight. The competitive 13th district includes Johnston and parts of Wake, Wayne and Harnett counties. It contains both suburban and rural communities, the Triangle and the Sand Hills, and yes, Democrats and Republicans. Democratic State Senator Wiley Nickel is taking on Republican political newcomer Bo Hines. And we are going to hear from both candidates separately tonight. This is not a debate. We want to share about tonight's format with you. So to determine which candidate you heard from first, just before this broadcast, we had a coin toss. Old school. Senator Nickel won and decided to go second. We should also point out we have not shared the questions with either campaign and they will not hear one another's answers during today's taping. They will have an equal amount of time to respond. Now, let's begin with our first candidate. Bo Hines is a political newcomer looking to help Republicans retake control of Congress. He played football for one season at North Carolina State before transferring to Yale University to hone in on his passion for politics. Hines also worked for his father's licensed apparel company. He's steadily risen up the Republican Party ranks, speaking ahead of former President Trump at a pair of political rallies in North Carolina this year. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Absolutely. So let's get started with our first question. Now, you called abortion murder in an interview earlier this year, and you said you only support the procedure in the case of where a mother's life might be in danger. Are there any exceptions you do think are acceptable? Well, there are certain exceptions. You can look at what happened in Ohio with a 10-year-old girl. In that instance, I think if that's just an absolute horrible tragedy where an exception would have to be made. But, you know, I'm pro-life, and I think my position is much less radical than my opponent's position, which is really abortion all the way up to the point of birth, even post-birth. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, if you're a pro-choice Democrat, you know, this is stuff, usually you have a boundary. That boundary might be heartbeat, might be 15 weeks, but I think most Americans agree that we shouldn't be allowing abortion all the way up to the point of birth. Post-birth abortion? Well, you know, Wiley is endorsed by the Progressive Caucus. He sought that endorsement. And, you know, if there's an abortion procedure that happens where the baby comes out and is still alive, you know, many in that, and many in that caucus have said that they would support allowing the baby to suffocate on a table. I can't fact check that, but we'll come back to that. Um, if elected, I want to know, would you support a federal ba a law banning abortion or limiting abortion? Well, it's a state's rights issue at this point. I don't think it's a federal issue. Obviously, with the Dobbs decision, it pushes the rights you know, back to the states. And you know, this is a Raleigh decision, not a Washington decision. And just for clarity, you mentioned the Ohio case. Are you saying that you do would accept an exception for rape or incest in North Carolina? I think in certain cases, yes, obviously in a case like that where, you know, a 10 year old woman or 10 year old girl, I should say, obviously should not be able to go through with that pregnancy. I mean, that's that, that's something that's a horrific tragedy that, that there has to be exceptions in place for. OK, so, so is it more the rape and the incest or her age, I guess? Well, I mean, I think it's a combination of, of both. But you have to look at each individual case and look at each individual circumstance and see what happens there. I want to talk now about what you think is causing high inflation in this country. I've heard you before point to government overspending, and you've specifically talked about the devaluing of the dollar as a result of inflation. And I wanted you to clarify that uh, because the dollar's actual value right now is the strongest it's been in two decades. It's now more than the British pound. It's on par with the euro. Uh, for the first time in a very long time. So what do you mean that the dollar is losing value? Well, this has to deal with the global economy collapsing. I mean, as we continue to blow our budget out in the U.S. Congress, we continue to overspend and continue to give more money to the overbloated government bureaucracies. This does undermine the value of the dollar over time. It makes purchasing power go down. It impacts every single day Americans when they go to the gas pump, when they go to the grocery stores. And look, they are hurting right now. With 8.3% inflation, that is the equivalent of one month salary for the average American. I know in my household, my wife and I can't afford to give up one month's salary. We have bills to pay. We have rent to pay. You know, this is something that's hurting people every single day. And their number one priority is, is the economy. You know, they have to be able to afford their everyday needs. And that's something we have to address immediately in the next Congress. And part of that is making sure we rein in over bloated government spending. Yeah, what concrete actions would you take in Congress if elected to reduce costs for North Carolinians? Well, the first thing we have to do is pass a balanced budget amendment. We haven't done this since 1994 when Newt Gingrich was, was Speaker of the House. I mean, now 
we have to look at where we are and just look at how much, you know, billions and trillions of dollars we're pouring into this government bureaucracy, we're pouring into nations, you know, across the globe. A lot of these things do nothing to benefit the American people. We need to make sure, just like us everyday Americans have to balance our checkbooks, Congress should have to balance their checkbook as well. Okay, so you've celebrated uh, being endorsed by former President Trump. Obviously, you were just with him, I guess, a couple weeks ago. And members of Congress like Madison Cawthorn, Matt Gates, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, representatives who are, let's face it, polarizing figures in, in politics. Now, you've been compared to them by your opponent. How would you be different from them? Well, you know, I don't, I don't have any intention on being a celebrity politician. I want to work for the people of North Carolina's 13th district. The first thing I do, if I have the privilege to serve them in the U.S. Congress, is I would put a sign on my door it says this district belongs to the people of North Carolina's 13th. And you know, we have to make sure that we have politicians that are there to get things done, not there just to be show ho horses, but work horses. And that's what I plan to be for our, our folks in this community. Do you feel like those, those representatives are not getting things done? Well, you know, in certain cases, you know, I'd like to see you know, a lot more activity involved. But in the reality is we don't have the majority in Congress right now. So there's not much they can do. They're blocked by Democrats, you know, almost tooth and nail on every single you know, piece of agenda or piece of policy they attempt to push right now. Right. But we, there, there's a strong likelihood that that might change in the fall elections. There's certainly a lot of people who think that it might happen. Um, if that happens, what can we expect to see from you? Well, you know, there's a lot of different things we need to address. The economy being one, reigning in inflation. I think two is securing our border. Every single district in the United States is now a border district. As drugs continue to flow over the southern border into our communities, impacting the lives of people, you know, in very dramatic ways. I mean, we've had more death by distribution charges in this area, I think, than ever before now. You know, we have, we have drug dealers on the loose. We have drugs flowing into our communities. Fentanyl is ruining communities across this country, including here in North Carolina's 13th district, and that flows back to the border. We have to make sure that border is secure. We have to make sure that people can immigrate here legally and lawfully, and we welcome that, but we do not need millions of illegal migrants flowing over our southern border into our communities, even here in North Carolina. Yeah, let's talk about immigration, because you have called for a 10-year ban on immigration, and I want to understand who's included in that ban. Are you talking about asylum seekers or people who are here on work visas who are trying to get citizenship to this country? Who's included in that ban? Yeah, so, you know, our visa workers would be protected. Our farmers rely on H-2A workers, H-2B workers. I mean, these are people that come here. They work really hard. You know, they, they contribute to our, our community in a positive way. They go back home and obviously the money they make there you know, really helps them care for their families. But you know, in reality, I think that our immigration system is so broken right now, I wouldn't call it a ban, I'd call it a moratorium. You know, we have to make sure our borders are secure. We have to make sure we can properly vet people before they come into our country. We have to make sure we know who these people are. And once we do that, I think that we can actually have a successful immigration system that allows for diverse immigration processes. You know, granting amnesty to 12 million people in the United States and letting people flow here from, you know, basically Central and South America, that's not diverse immigration to me. I want to welcome people from across the globe, from all different nations, and want to contribute and assimilate here. And they just want to be hardworking Americans that love our country. You know, we welcome those people. Uh, what, yeah, what do you mean by not diverse immigration? Do you think that that's too many people from Central America? We should have people from, say, where else? Well, you know, I think we, we need to welcome people from across the globe, and I think it makes, us, it makes it harder in the United States to do that, you know, when we have millions of people flowing from one, one part of the world. You know, I want to see people, I want to see people from Africa, I want to see people from Europe, I want to see people, you know, from all different, all different areas of the globe come here that want to be hardworking Americans, love our country, you know, want a better opportunity at life. But, you know, when we allow millions of migrants to flow from one part of the world, it just restricts our ability to do that. People from Europe and Africa are also held up right now at the southern border. What do you think needs to be done in Congress to make sure that it's a more efficient process there at the border? Well, we have to shut it down first. Like I said, we have to make sure we can properly vet people. And I think that takes a lot more resources there at the southern border, which, you know, we don't have right now. And we've talked about, you know, securing it. We've talked about, you know, a lot of different processes for decades at a time. And really, we haven't seen the action there. So I think that, you know, providing ICE, providing, you know, our, our border patrol with every single resource available to make sure, one, they're protected, and two, they can protect our communities is what needs to happen immediately from Congress. But when you're talking about a moratorium, a 10-year moratorium, <clears throat> it's unclear whether you're also talking about your H-1B visas. And uh, as you know, you know, the Triangle is a huge tech community here. Um, mm -hmm. And we rely a lot on immigrant, in, immigrant workers coming from other countries to supply the labor that our employers are having a hard time finding in the open market. Uh, a moratorium might make it more difficult for them to hire the talent that they need from other countries. So how would you balance well, that? Well, I mean, I, I just said I'd, I would exclude visa work, workers in that, in that program. So, I mean, I, I, can you explain to me how that would make it harder, you know, for, for them to come here? I don't 
don't think it would change a thing. All visas? Okay, so H-1B is... Sure. Okay. Because yeah. um, kind of, we're talking about the border, and I'm thinking, well, that's not really the border exactly. Yeah. Um, but um, So you do agree that there's um, that the government has a, a, a sufficient mechanisms in place to vet those workers? Sure, workers that are coming here, absolutely. I mean, our farmers have had you know a lot of the same workers coming here for 20 years at a time. These people have you know become part of their families. I think that's, that's incredible. They do great work for our community. You know, everyone in the United States loves to eat, and those workers do a lot to make sure we can put food on the table for, for our families. Let's talk about foreign policy with the time that we have left. Uh, how, what do you think of the United States' current support of Ukraine, both militarily and monetarily? Uh, do you think it's sufficient? Well, you know, I, I think Russia is a tremendous foreign adversary, and we have to do everything we can to push back on them. I mean, obviously, this is an egregious abuse of power from a country that's marching in, you know, to, to a country that, you know, has a right to exist. You know, and we should protect them. But honestly, what I have to tell you as well is that we need to do everything we can to protect the American people first, and then we can start looking globally. You know, I think that we've neglected people here at home. Our economy is in shambles, and we need to make sure that's corrected before we start looking at putting more money into defending Ukraine. You think enough has been done in terms of aid to At this Ukraine. point, I think it's sufficient, but we have to see what continues to happen. Obviously, Vladimir Putin is calling up, I think, 300,000 know, you know, new soldiers. I mean, we just have to watch how the process develops. Uh, the president of Ukraine has said that the money and the military aid is why they've been able to successfully push back on Russian forces in recent weeks. Would that hurt them then in that process? You know, I, I'm not sure. I think that our allies across the globe also need to step up and contribute in, you know, in a meaningful way. You know, they understand that a lot of times they can put the bill on the United States and there's no ramifications for that. We need to make sure we're getting the most out of our allies across the globe and fighting these adversaries. Bo Hines, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Best of luck. Up next, we'll be back with Wiley Nickel. Stay with us. At WRAL, we have the tools. On the Gold Offer 5000 radar. We have the team. We are live here in downtown Raleigh. And WRAL News at 6 has the people you've known and trusted for decades. We begin tonight with breaking news. Every night. Everywhere. No matter how you're watching. And that's coverage you can count on. Welcome back to this election special. We are now meeting our second candidate, State Senator Wiley Nickel. North Carolina State Senator Wiley Nickel is a criminal defense attorney who lives in Cary. He's been in elected office in North Carolina since 2019. He previously worked for two White House administrations, first under former Vice President Al Gore and then former President Barack Obama. He's seeking to help Democrats retain control in the U.S. House. Senator Nickel, thank you so much for your time this evening as well. I want to begin talking about abortion access. Uh, it's now obviously up to states to decide after Roe was overturned this summer. Do you think the government has any role to play in where and when women can access abortion? Yeah, yeah of course. You know, and the question, of course, is who draws the lines you know, for, for how we do that. And, and I believe women and doctors should be the ones who make those decisions. As a state senator, I've always supported a woman's right to choose. And I'm hopeful that when I get elected to Congress, the first bill that I will vote for will be a bill to put the protections of Roe v. Wade into federal law. And in this race, there is a huge choice. My opponent says he wants to ban abortion with no exceptions, literally a death sentence for many women. I have to follow up on that. Okay, so you're saying the government's role in where, when, and where, when women can ask case abortion should be protecting that, right? Yeah. We're talking about specifically, is there a line at which the government should step in to um, protect uh, the, the fetus? It, it, should be, it should be women and doctors who make that decision about where the line goes, not politicians in Washington. These are decisions that are deeply personal and they should be taken out of the, this political space Women and doctors are the ones who should decide. Uh, we were just talking with your opponent before, and he, he said that you had been endorsed by a caucus that believes in post-birth abortion. Can you respond to that? That's a lie. It's not a thing. Of course, that's, that's not something I support. You know, um, the, the position I've had has always been clear. I support putting the protections of Roe v. Wade into federal law. So prices are obviously punishingly high right now for families, particularly people on fixed incomes or seniors, working families as well. And Democrats are being blamed right now for just not doing enough to stem the rise of these prices. What concrete action can you take in Congress to bring down prices for North Carolinians? Well, I'm glad you asked because 
you know, Washington just is not working for North Carolina families. We've got to bring down the cost. We're talking about the cost of housing, the cost of health care, the cost of your groceries. But we have solutions to those problems. And I, and I brought it with me here today, gave you a copy of it. This is a 30-point inflation action plan. These are a number of things we can do to help bring down those costs because people are suffering and they need people in Washington willing to work across the aisle to do what's right for North Carolina. So you know, what that means specifically is bolstering our supply chain, investing in U.S. manufacturing, and cracking down on corporations who are price gouging at the pump. Do you think and, Republicans... And, and, and I'd encourage folks, they can see this all on our website, yeah. Wiley Nichols. Well, while we have this time, I want to yeah. make sure we use it as best we can. Republicans have specifically pointed to government overspending. We know we saw stimulus checks go out under both the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And economists do think that they that may have contributed to inflation. So what role do you think that the Biden administration has played in rising costs? Well, you know, I, I think the Inflation Reduction Act is a good place to start because that's gonna bring down the deficit and the debt. You know, that we're putting money towards that. We've gotta control our spending. We're spending far too much. That's, that's a problem, like you said, that's, that's a bipartisan problem. You know, Democratic administrations and Republican administrations have been spending far too much in Washington, and that's, that's a real problem. But for me, you know, I'm someone who's running as a moderate. The group I will be caucusing with is the Blue Dog Democrats, who stand for a strong national defense, and fiscal responsibility. Those are the, the values I'm gonna take with me when I go to Washington. I kind of have to ask this question. You're talking about controlling spending. Are you talking about cutting spending? Are there areas of the budget that you think are right for cutting? No, I mean, I, the place I'd like to cut is the amount of money we pay for our debt. But I think it's a balanced approach. We gotta talk about you know, the, the revenue and the spending side. And for me, that means leveling the playing field for working families and making sure that corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share. So we've got to do both things, and, and we can. So you were just talking about being a moderate. In your ads, that is how you portray yourself, of course. Um, but in the state Senate, I've covered you for a long time, and you've often voted to the left of your caucus. Why should voters think that you will be more in the middle when you go to Washington? I think, first of all, in this race, I'm the moderate by far. My opponent is a far-right extremist. You know, he's... He, he's campaigning to the right of Madison Cawthorn. So, so on that level, you know, I think you need to make that point. But in Washington, it's very different. You know, in North Carolina, we don't spend enough. We don't spend enough for our teachers. We don't spend enough on health care. In Washington, we're spending far too much. So you know, we, we've got to balance our budget every single year in North Carolina. That's a good thing. In Washington, we don't. Let's talk about the border. Um, obviously, the Biden administration taking a beating as well on this issue. There have been a record two million encounters at the southern border this year. And there are also two million pending immigration cases for the people who right now are trying to seek asylum. And frankly, many of them doing it the right way, but there aren't enough courts and there aren't enough judges to see all of these cases. So what should Congress do to respond to this crisis? I mean, I think it's, it's two things. Number one, we gotta support border security. I support efforts to secure our border, but we've gotta make sure that we have due process rights for everyone and we treat people compassionately at the border. So I, I think there's a role to do both. And in Congress, you know, we, we need to fix a broken immigration system. And, and on this issue, especially, there is a huge difference you know, my opponent who you just talked to said the first thing he wants to do in Congress is put a 10-year moratorium on all immigration. That would literally wreck our economy. We, we need folks willing to solve problems in Washington, not play partisan games. So we hear a lot about we're going to fix migration. migration. Immigration is broken. What are some steps that you think need to be taken to fix immigration? Yeah, I mean, we, we got to be talking about expanding the, the amount of people who can come here legally with, through the visa system. There's a huge backlog we've got to fix. You know, we need to have comprehensive immigration reform. You know, and, and in the triangle especially, we're talking about skilled labor. It ought to be just as simple as if you get an advanced degree in the U.S., you get, you know, a green card with your diploma so we can keep the best and brightest here helping our economy. 
But what about those that are not skilled? I'm thinking about the asylum seekers, and you know, as we've pointed out, I mean, it is people from Central America, but it's also people coming from other places like Haiti and Africa and Europe that are actually coming across our southern border as well. You know, what needs to be done in Congress to to try to fix that problem? I mean, there's a number of things we can do to secure our border, you know, without resorting to a physical wall. And and you know, I certainly support all efforts to secure the border. Number one, that's you know, I, I think we need to continue to say that. And uh, you know, and make sure that we have an orderly process, you know, for for people who have a legitimate claim. All right, let's talk about foreign policy. I want to talk about the support that we have seen already from Congress and from the Biden administration for Ukraine. Um, do you think that there is a limit to how much the U.S. government should be supporting Ukraine with military aid or with money? I, I mean, I think we're on a really good path. The U.S. is you know, put together a broad international coalition. We're seeing results in Ukraine right now. We've got to stand up for democracy and stand against Putin's, you know, invasion of Ukraine. So I, I think we're, we're doing the right thing there and we're seeing results. Um, and and, I, and I, what, what I think is, is, is really wonderful too about the, the success we're having there is, you know, we've got Seymour Johnson in this congressional district uh, and we've got, you know, folks, you know, fighter pilots there supporting this mission. So this is something where folks in this district are helping as well. Do you feel like the United States should be more involved in Ukraine's defense? I think we're, we've got just the right amount of international support right now. And I think you're seeing, you know, Putin is, is, is on his heels here. Well, we've, you know, you were just talking about controlling spending a little while ago. You know, we've heard calls from some on the right and some on the left, actually, that, you know, that, that the, the writing of check after check after check to Ukraine for weapons and for support um, is it's becoming a burden on, on the U.S. economy. How do you how do you reconcile those two things? I think I think the real burden on our economy is if if Vladimir Putin is allowed to do whatever he wants across the globe, we're going to be having to deal with this issue all over the world if we don't stop this attack on democracy here. And the, the international coalition that we've built has done a great job at making sure that, you know, everyone knows that, you know, if you go and attack a democracy like Ukraine, the international community is going to respond. One of the issues that we have seen as a priority for families is education and the learning loss that happened during the pandemic. What would you do specifically in Congress? You have children. I know this is something that you care about as well to try to make up some of those losses. How can you help the Department of Education? What can you do specifically in Congress to help families? You know, number one, you know, as a state senator, this has been a big priority for me. We've got to invest in public education. We're not doing nearly enough. One of the issues that I've championed as a senator is not getting universal pre-K. We, we ought to have two years of universal pre-K. That would do so much to bring down the costs for childcare for, for many families. So that's one of my biggest priorities is making sure we make that investment because when you do, you get much better outcomes, you know, educational outcomes later on. All right, Senator Nickel, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck to you as well. Thanks so much for having me. All right, yeah. we'll be right back. While the world around us has changed rapidly, WREL's commitment to you has not. We're committed to giving you the facts and the information you need so you can stay safe. We have meteorologists working around the clock so you can be prepared for what's coming next. Plus, that's why there's one place where more people come for local news and weather. We're with you every step of the way, no matter where you are. And that's why we are coverage you can count on. A special thank you to both candidates for joining us in studio for this conversation. Election Day is November 8th, and WRAL is your headquarters for everything you need to know about the races and the candidates. The WRAL Voter Guide is up and ready for you right now on WRAL.com and our news app. There you can find your voting and early voting locations, see sample ballots, and read more about other candidates in other races. You can also see Laura Leslie's brand new segment, Really, really interesting behind the scenes. It's, we're calling it NC Votes 101. And so what the idea is, is we want viewers to let us know what their questions are about the elections process. So we can help to demystify it, show folks what happens behind the scenes on election day so that people understand exactly how this all works. And, you know, so we'd love to have your suggestions. You can find a place to send them to us on WRIL.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night.